Before we begin this episode, we would like to shed some light on what is happening in India and Nepal. Over the last few days, we've seen the alarming effects of the second wave of COVID-19 that has hit these countries. The need for emergency support is greater than ever before. We have linked some resources we could find in the description box. Please help and support. And let us be mindful that the COVID-19 pandemic is far from over. Hello everybody, namaste. Welcome back to Anthropos. I'm Simone. I'm Satashma. We are back again with our third episode, Cities Reimagined. And this episode is a special one, as we will be looking at this challenging topic of cities through a global lens and a local lens, as we have two guest speakers on the show today. Today, more than 55% of the world's population live in urban areas, and that is expected to increase to 68% by 2050. Projections show that urbanization, the gradual shift in residence of the human population from rural to urban areas, combined with the overall growth of the world's population, could add another 2.5 billion people to urban areas by 2050. What is important to note is that India, China and Nigeria will account for 35% of the projected growth of the world's urban population between 2018 and 2050. It is projected that India will have added 416 million urban dwellers, China 255 million, and Nigeria 189 million. Furthermore, by 2030, the world is projected to have 43 megacities with more than 10 million inhabitants, most of them in developing regions. While one in eight people live in 32 megacities worldwide, close to half of the world's urban dwellers reside in much smaller settlements with fewer than 500,000 inhabitants. So as the world continues to urbanize, sustainable development heavily relies on the successful management of urban growth. Many countries will face challenges in meeting the needs of their growing urban population, including for housing, transportation, energy systems, and other infrastructure, as well as for employment and basic services such as education and healthcare. Integrated policies to improve the lives of both urban and rural dwellers are needed. While strengthening the linkages between urban and rural areas, building on their existing economic, social, and environmental ties. To ensure that the benefits of urbanization are fully shared and inclusive, policies to manage urban growth needs to ensure access to infrastructure and social services for all. To discuss this further, our first guest speaker for this episode is Dr. Pablo Toral. Pablo Toral is a professor of environmental studies and international relations at Beloit College, Wisconsin. He believes in involving students in three of his interests, activism, sustainability, and teaching. While he teaches a range of courses at the college, one course that I took with him that made a significant impact was sustainable cities. From this course, I was able to understand the important roles uh, that cities play in our lives and their impact over our economies, policies, art, culture, identities, and health. Some of the other major themes that we explored in the course were environmental justice, green buildings, urban sprawl, global climate change, and sustainable energy, along with transportation policies. Welcome to Anthropos Pablo. We are so happy to have you on the show and look forward to learning about your perspectives on sustainable cities. So we would like to start this episode with a simple yet challenging question. What are cities? Cities are uh, uh, groupings of people who decide to come together to work for a common purpose. Defined it very simply. Thank you. (laughs) Um, but again, like terms such as sustainable cities, eco city, green city, and green spaces have flood li- flooded literature today. So, however, we would love to know what it really means for cities to become sustainable, and is achieving this even possible? Yes. So, uh, the, the concept of sustainability is it's uh, it's one that adds uh, a really interesting layer to to my definition. Of course, uh, I just wanted to get to start with a provocative, uh, simple answer. So, see, the, see, the concept of sustainability as well has different meanings to it. Uh, you know, cities have to be um, environmentally sustainable. They have to be socially sustainable. They have to be culturally, economically, politically sustainable. So there is many, many different, um, you know, meanings to the concept of sustainability. So depending on, uh, you know, which one you're more interested in, we can get deeper into, 
into, into either of them. But in general, uh, the concept of sustainability basically has, uh, an, 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 has a couple of dimensions to it. One is temporal, the idea that it is a workable project in the long term. And the other one is collective. It's the idea that you know we as individuals are together in the long run with others. Uh, humans are other you know, uh, forms of life as well, which uh, addresses the, the connection to, to nature. What would you think are the factors that should be considered when determining whether a city or a community is sustainable? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the main characteristics is that people want to be there. And when people want to be in a particular place, what that suggests is that conditions are probably uh, um, decent, at least. So that means that uh, the place is welcoming, the place is open, the place offers opportunities, it is empowering, uh, people have choices, they're given choices, and the quality of life uh, is, is decent enough that people would choose to be there uh, rather than in other places. I remember reading The Death and Life of Great American Cities by activist, journalist, and academic Jane Jacobs in your class. And one quote that stayed with me even after is, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they're cre created by everybody. So keeping this in mind, why would you say it is important to include the experiences of individuals, households, and neighborhoods in a sustainable city? Yes, so just to build on Anne Simone's uh, uh, um, a quote of Jane Jacobs. Um, so Jacobs goes on to say that uh, the, the key city, a, a living city, is one that uh, thrives in diversity, and that's important too. And diversity, just like sustainability, has many different layers to it. It's diversity of people. I mean, she was uh, probably a social scientist at heart. Uh, so it means people of different backgrounds, racially, ethnically, economically, um, you know, socially, so that that component is very important, but also at um, um, multiplicity of uses. You know, uh, Jacobs was very much against a city that was divided up by, by different use, residential, commercial, business. She believed that integrating all three of them was critical. She was also very much against the separation of, uh, you know, the built environment versus the living environment versus nature. She also believed that they all needed to be integrated. So it's that kind of diversity of use, diversity of people. And that is very important as well, a very important component of a livable city and a sustainable city. So now that we did kind of touch on individuals and households and neighborhoods, so how do you think um, can people actively engage in making their own neighborhoods healthier and more ecological places? And it would be great to hear your personal take on this. So it is very important that people are empowered. Uh, people are not going to want to be in a place where they don't, they don't call the shots. They're not going to be able to build a community that they want. Jane Jacobs actually built on this as well. She looked at different cities in the U.S. of very similar background, fa facing similar challenges, some of which did very well and some of which didn't do very well. And uh, one of the arguments that she made was exactly the point that, that you, you're just uh, you know, leading us to, the idea that of community empowerment. Uh, having the community participate in making the decisions that matter to them is very important. You know, how to reach the right um, balance between community empowerment at the neighborhood level and uh, master planning a little bit more broadly is the critical component here because what you don't want is for cities to be uh, broken up into different independent uh, communities that share some proximity and the political belonging in a political unit, but they don't share anything else. And that's exactly the point that she's trying to, to avoid. But to prevent that from happening, what she's talking about is the creation of very active institutions that will facilitate the involvement of the community in making the decisions that matter to them, while providing networks uh, that will tie them or bring them together with other neighborhoods where they can actually pool resources and, um, you know, build on, 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 on shared strengths, you know, learn from each other. And that is the key component that, that she was talking about. You know, uh, one of the, the case studies that I normally use in my class, because I normally give my cities, uh, my students an international perspective, is the city of Curitiba in Brazil that has been considered one of the pioneers of, um, of, of, of sustainability. And one of the key aspects of Curitiba was precisely this. Um, the city was subjected to 
periodic flooding uh, during the rainy season. So uh, one of the, uh, the decision of the mayor to address this, particularly um, to prevent loss of human life, but also as a, as a tool for empowerment and upward social mobility. The people who lived in the floodplain who lost their homes tended to be precisely some of the poorer. So losing their homes on a regular basis really created more obstacles for them to move up. So one of the, uh, the decisions that he made was to relocate um, these people into mixed housing. Uh, uh, the city granted permits uh, to that some developers that wanted to, to build uh, high rises for you know, uh, people of very high net worth. And uh, the city negotiated a plan to bring some of these people into these developments um, on the condition that uh, the city would give them a number of, of, of benefits, tax breaks, et cetera, that there would be some greenery. And the space in the flat plain was actually turned into parkland. And the city basically turned it over to the community Communities. Okay, we're going to build a park here. What would you like to see in this? And the city gave them uh, monies to actually build something with it. And one of the characteristics is that every neighborhood, and in some of them, people were together on the basis of, of culture, ethnicity, background. And some of them, most of them chose to have a cultural monument. It could be a museum, it could be a, a music uh, hall, a theater. And uh, the city tried to make sure that the, the facilities that were built by the community integrate themselves into the, the floodplain so that they would overlook the river. Uh, they would offer plenty of parkland uh, spaces for people to recreate um, when the waters were down, but also an anchor, a cultural anchor in the community where the community could celebrate their many achievements and be proud of their heritage. And that is incredibly important. It's a very good case of where um, the city at the top work to collaborate with the communities, but empower the communities give, give, by giving them resources and also to, um, to allow them to reinvent themselves in ways that would make them more resilient. And resiliency is also another important component of a sustainable city. One, a community that can bounce back from, from a shock whenever it produces itself. And to do that, they have to be physically resilient, but also socially and institutionally resilient. The institutions have to, to withstand the blow and be there to help the community uh, build itself up. Your answer like sets the tone for our next question. So, you know, although there are some significant challenges that we will talk about later in this, um, in our conversation, um, we have seen like, many um, sustainable urban developments um, as well. For instance, we have seen Bhutan that has achieved carbon net zero. And like you mentioned, uh, the Brazilian city Curitiba, they have like rapid public transport system, which is one of the many um, sustainable uh, features of their city. So what do you think are some of the other exciting city development developments hap happening across the world? Yes. So, uh, in the in uh, your your question, in a way, makes me think about climate change as being one of the most challenging, uh, you know, uh, dilemmas that we have ahead of us. You know, many cities have, uh, you know, made plans to try to achieve carbon neutrality. You mentioned Bhutan being one of the, the leaders in the world. You know, the city where I'm at, uh, Beloit, um, the city council just passed a commitment to reach carbon neutrality in 20 years. In, uh, so that that in itself is, is really important. So what cities can do is, is huge. You know, more than half of the world's population lives in a city. So if the cities actually take leadership on, on, on carbon neutrality and many other aspects, they can make a difference. And if we think about, you know, where the sources of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from, and greenhouse gas emissions are critical to the problem of climate change, cities can make a difference. And the main components are energy production and uh, normally energy production happens close to a city because of the nature of the fossil fuel industry. We basically uh, transported the, this horse to a city or the proximity of a city, then um, normally fossil fuels, we burn them and uh, we produce energy that we pump into the city. So the cities can actually pass legislation uh, work or work with the utilities to try to make them to move away from those, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, carbon rich sources to um, 
to carbon-free sources. Another one is transportation. How we move around is very important. And you mentioned that how uh, rapid transit in uh, public transportation in Curitiba was a critical component of, uh, of the city's quality of life. So that's another area where the cities can make a huge difference. Um, many cities in low-income, middle-income country have adopted similar plans to, to Curitiba's on very little money uh, with great success. And one of the characteristics of Curitiba's approach is the success, the projects have to be implemented quickly. The success has to be immediate because if people don't see it, there's gonna be mountain opposition to it that can actually derail the process. And that's what cities can do. Cities can actually think about creative and quick ways to make significant changes um, you know, as fast as possible. So in transportation, that's important. Another one is residential and housing. You know, a significant uh, a very large number of our emissions comes from uh, heating the buildings, from the, the built energy that goes into the materials that uh, we'll bring into our, our, our cities. So taking that into consideration is also very important. So cities that look into all of those different factors can make a huge difference. Food is another one. Uh, so we need energy uh, to power ourselves, just like we need energy to power our buildings and our um our transportation system. So how, seed, how cities feed their people is also a very important component. We can really find ways to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of the food that we eat. And all of that is within uh, you know, um, the toolkit that city planners and city uh, policymakers have. So cities have a lot of autonomy to make these kinds of decisions. But moving on to challenges, with an ever-increasing global population and rising urbanization, creating safe, resilient, like you said, resilient and sustainable cities have been at the top of most green agendas for many cities around the world. However, what do you think are the most pressing challenges of sustainable urban development? Mm -hmm. So one of the correct, as a social scientist, one of the, the things that we look at is that it's, it's people, the people who are involved. Agency is very important. We think about agency, uh, the, you know, these dichotomy agency structure. So we do have a, a capacity for agency, but there is these structural determinants around us that constrain the actions that we do. But we actually can change a little bit of agency, some of those structural conditions and maybe make them empower us rather than and disempower us. So how do we go about that? So uh, we need to work with people. So it's very important to create a multi-stakeholder coalition that brings together everyone that has a stake in, in this. So the ability of cities to bring uh, these multi-stakeholder coalitions together is critical. And to do that in a way that one, takes their um, concerns into consideration, two, that addresses those concerns while allowing them to build on their strengths, the knowledge of the different uh, groups in the community, the skills that they have. And to do that, it is very important to, to build a very broad-based support coalition because you're gonna be needing to work with other people. One that will be able to persuade the, what we call the block of the opposition coalition that will probably um, try to, to block these changes. So this is, uh, you know, in the social sciences, we look at the distributional effects of policy change. You know, um, if we stay, stay the course, the distribution is not gonna change dramatically. But if we introduce a, a, a significant uh, disturbance, a change in the way we do things, there's gonna be winners, there's gonna be losers. So the question is, how will they organize themselves? The winners, how will they organize themselves to continue to push for this change? And how will the losers organize themselves to try to block the change because they stand to lose? So that is the critical, uh, a critical um, uh, component. And sustainable cities have to be institutionally sustainable. They have to provide institutional avenues for support coalitions and block coalitions to work together so that the block coalition gets, you know, um, um, in a way co-opted or invited into the support coalition by offering ways to address their distributional concerns. And that is critical. And that, of course, there is no perfect formula because that really changes from community to community, depending on the economic basis of each uh, city. Following up to that question, we have to highlight another problem that unexpectedly posed a challenge to many cities around the world, COVID-19. The relationship between cities and humans is a very important one, like you mentioned, and human interactions, public transports are all key components to a sustainable city. And cities are lifeless collections of buildings without these. So how do you think the COVID pandemic has and will change the future of our cities? 
COVID-19 has actually made uh, some of the challenges that Jane Jacobs uh, uh, pointed out like almost a century ago. It feels like, a, you know, a century ago. They clear uh, if you get the, the multiple use mixed use city that she was calling for, people are going to be working and living within very close proximity of where they do everything. So public transportation uh, needs to be completely redefined with that in mind. So COVID-19 wouldn't have been, um, you know, as big a problem from a transportation perspective if people could walk to work, if people could walk to school. Um, and, and that is unfortunately something that we lost, at least in North America, in the context of the mid 20th century, when planners decided that we needed to divide up spaces in the city, you know, business sector from commercial sector, from the residential sector, which basically meant we needed to reinvent, reorganize our transportation system. But by separating out where we live from where uh, we, we, we sleep, I mean, we actually made um, a problem much, much, much worse. So... If we had taken that into consideration, then probably COVID-19 wouldn't have been so hard on, um, on our uh, urban environments because we could have walked to work. We could have biked to work. So here in Wisconsin, uh, we've been advocating for biking and the capital of Wisconsin here to the North Madison has a very extensive uh, system of bike trails that were incredibly used this, even this, this winter through the really cold winters of Wisconsin as people you know, prefer to bike to work, you bundle up, you go to work. It's not something that will work for everyone. But for those people who can make it work, you're really minimizing the danger of contagion. So, so public transportation can be used more effectively to target the kinds of people who cannot go to walk, uh, to work by walking or by, by, um, by biking. And this is one of the challenges, for example, that I'm facing here in Beloit. I'm working with the city to map out you know, our uh, carbon neutrality policy. And one of the challenges that I'm facing with uh, the, 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 the city council and uh, the city uh, employees is that when I, I bring up the idea of hiking trails, biking trails, they say, well, we can't, we can't put recreation first. And I say, I'm not talking about recreation, I'm talking about transportation. So it's really hard how, you know, for the people here in town, for them, Anything that does not involve a motor uh, does not qualify as transportation. And our community is small enough that a good system of bike trails will probably take care of 90% of the transportation needs of the community, making our community healthier, our air cleaner, our, you know, areas, uh, you know, that our streets greener. And all of that is such a low hanging fruit. And it's been really, really hard for me to realize that I just cannot persuade them uh, you know, they do raise a few interesting points. Well, not everybody has an able bo is able body and can, can ride a bike, you know, when it's 25 degrees below in the winter. Yes, but we can make arrangements for that. Mm -hmm. But for most people, uh, and in a small place like Beloit, most people live within five miles of work. So five miles is walking distance for many, is biking distance for most. Mm -hmm. So if we can actually get all of those people onto the trails, and out of the cars, imagine how we can lower our emissions and how much healthier people will be. But the problem that we have is that the city has a few bike trails that go nowhere that are used in different parts of town to let people go and walk the dog. But they're not really meant to be a system of transportation. That is the change that we have to, to operate in people's mentality so they can actually start to think about more creative ways of doing things much more efficiently, much more healthily. So one of the themes that we are trying to capture in our episode is the relationship between urbanization, high income communities and sustainability. With the fastest growing cities being in low income countries around the world, do you think cities and communities need to be high income to be sustainable? Not at all. And, and uh, so uh, sustainability doesn't have to be a, a luxury item. Uh, so th there is this idea uh, that, uh, that is, has been common, really, really tested in the social sciences that suggests that, um, you know, that there is a correlation between income level and, and, and a clean environment, preference for a clean environment. Economists are very good to tell us this, that uh, at some point around $5,000 uh, per capita per year is when 
people start to worry more about the environment and less about their work opportunities. But we have seen plenty of examples from all around the world where communities that don't make $5,000 per year have actually organized themselves for a clean environment. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the pollution is affecting communities, uh, low-income communities more. So uh, creating sustainable cities is actually a, a progressive tool, not a regressive tool. It's one that should help us create more equitable communities. Um, if we don't build sustainable communities, if we are making people breathe polluted air, drink polluted water, and deny them access to a green environment, wealthy people will be able to pay for that. So we'll be really increasing the gap in terms of quality of life. There will be a correlation between um, you know, income level and, and uh, all of those indicators of quality of life that have to do with the clean environment. But we don't have to do it that way, especially in, in you know, in small communities like like the one where I live, change it's a lot easier because it's it's easier. You know, uh, these communities are less segregated. But in big communities, we cannot afford you know to not involve low income communities because creating uh, you know more uh, livable um, you know neighborhoods it's critical to the quality of life and it's a critical tool for upward social mobility having to deal with diseases of poverty that include uh, breathing polluted air, drinking polluted water, being exposed to polluted environment will have long-term consequences, particularly on the development of children that will make them uh, less uh, competitive in the work market and it will decrease their ability to, uh, to move up. So, so sustainability has to be front and center, not only for, for those who believe in, um, you know, in, maybe in an ecocentric perspective where, you know, all species deserve a certain degree of moral equality, but also those who believe that um, giving people of different backgrounds equal opportunity should be a pillar of any uh, development strategy. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that was a very important note that our uh, viewers like understand. And now reflecting on the beginning of this episode and our conversation, we'd like to end our conversation with the question, what does sustainable city mean to you? Sustainable city is one where everybody um, feels that they belong, where they have the tools to make the city what it is, one that is healthy, one that is diverse, uh, one that is livable, and one where people uh, want to stay forever because it's a fun place, it's a good place, it's a, it's a healthy place, it's a clean place. It's, it's for us to enjoy. I, I remember, Simone, in class that you, you mentioned you really liked the idea of the biophilic uh, city. So, um, so a biophilic city is one in which we get exposed constantly to, to nature. And we don't have to live in that modern uh, understanding. There is a separation between, you know, the urban environment and nature. You know, the, both of them can be integrated. The built environment is the natural environment. It's made with, you know, nature. So we need to be able to shatter that. And, uh, and, it, and, you know, biophilia, it's also good for our minds. It's good for, for our mental health. So not only for our physical health uh, by cleaning up the environment around us, but also exposing ourselves to, to nature uh, makes us uh, concentrate better, relaxes us, and it gives us a much better mental health. So we owe it to ourselves. Thank you so much, um... Uh, Pablo, it was really good to meet you and um, our conversation has given a great introduction and also set the tone for our second conversation with a Nepali architect. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. It was really thank nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you very much, Itashma. Thank you, Simone, for, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.